So today's session is, I thought, amusingly titled, Do You Like Coffee With Your R Dessert? Java and Raspberry Pi. So let's start with a question. Who here has a Raspberry Pi? Ah, oh, okay, I'm talking to the right audience then, aren't I? I'm very glad to see that so many people have managed to get one of the Raspberry Pis. So what I'm gonna do this morning is to talk to you about some of the things we're doing as Oracle in terms of making sure that Java is well supported on the Raspberry Pi, making sure that you can do things with Java on the Raspberry Pi, and then I'm gonna show you some examples of things that I've done with Java on the Raspberry Pi, which hopefully will um, entertain you. So I worked for Sun for 14 years before we were acquired by Oracle, and one of the first things you notice when you become an Oracle employee is that lawyers get involved. So all of my presentations now have to have a safe harbor statement, which is basically saying that you, know, you must not take what I'm going to tell you as being a definition of our product direction in the future. I don't think it's really too important for the presentation that I'm giving you, but there it is. I have to put it up there. So I'm, I've given you enough time to read it. Uh, is it allowed to film? Sorry? Is it allowed to record use the camera? You may most certainly film my presentation if you want to. No, if, if you want to film me, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, so in terms of the agenda, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of background information on the Raspberry Pi project, how it came into being, a little bit of history. Um, it, it, I, I think it'll be quite interesting. I'm the kind of person who likes looking at how we got to where we are. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the history of this thing. Then we'll talk about the specifics of ARM processors because the Raspberry Pi, as I'm sure you know, has an ARM processor at its core. So we'll talk a bit about some of the features of ARM processors, what the, the people at ARM are doing and so on. Just out of a question, is anybody here an ARM employee? I'm not doing that because I want to, you know, sort of like say you can't be here. I just want to make sure that if I've got any questions or if people ask me any questions, then, you know, I've got somebody I can refer them back to. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. Right. Then we'll talk about Java and ARM on the Raspberry Pi and the specific things that we need to consider when it comes to both porting the JVM and also tuning the JVM for that particular platform. And then I'll go through some of the different things that you can do in terms of using Java with the Raspberry Pi and the different areas that you can look at um, in terms of interfacing. A lot of it is about interfacing because, okay, if you've got a JVM, you can write Java code, that's great. But the Raspberry Pi is all about what can you do with it in terms of talking to other things and, and stuff like that. And then we'll get into the demos and show you what you can actually do in reality. So let's talk a little bit about the Raspberry Pi, which is shown in the picture here. Now, the, the history of this is that it started a long time ago. Um, it really started back in 2006 when some people at Cambridge University thought about the way that computer science is taught, specifically in the UK. They were looking at what we have in the UK. Who's here from, who's from the UK here? Okay, reasonable number of people. So if I say, if I say ICT, some of you may actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, I can never remember what it actually stands for, but it's basically what we teach children at school in terms of technology. And so I have a six-year-old son who does ICT. He gets to learn how to use a mouse and he gets to draw pictures on the computer and things like that. So there's a curriculum for ICT. And the people at Cambridge University who were looking at this were rather concerned that what we were teaching children wasn't computer science. We were teaching them how to use applications how to use a web browser, how to use a word processor, how to do email, which is not computer science. So if we want people to become engineers, if we want people to go into industry and create new things and have great new ideas, they need to be trained properly, and we need to start doing that from a young age. And a lot of their inspiration came from a project that actually happened uh, way back in 1981, so 30, just over 30 years ago now, which was the BBC Micro project. So, okay, hands up again. Who had a BBC Micro? Oh, okay, one, two. Oh, right, okay, it's a younger audience today then. <laughs> so I had a BBC Micro when I was uh, at school. Uh, it wasn't my first computer. My first computer was a TRS-80. Who remembers that? Oh, yeah, of course, it's American, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So yes, yeah, so I had a TR, a Trash 80, great machine, 16 kilobytes of memory. Then I moved up to a BBC Micro, 32 kilobytes of memory. Wow, and color graphics. What more could you want? But the idea behind this was to teach children and to teach adults as well about computers. Because remember, 1981 was way before the internet, way before general computing as we know it. The IBM PC didn't come out until 1984. So this was all about getting people interested in computers and teaching them what it was. So they, they made this machine and then they had a series of television programs that took people through the basics of learning basic. So the, the people in the Raspberry Pi project thought that was a good idea. How could they do something similar, but in the year 2006, or you know, the end of the first decade of the millennium? And so they set about creating a device which they could use to teach children about programming in a way that they could understand, and most importantly, make it affordable. They didn't want to be creating a machine that was going to be the same price as a laptop or the same price as a, a normal PC. They wanted something very, very cheap that you could give to lots of school children and have them get excited about these kinds of ideas. So it went through a lot of, um, it took a long time to come to fruition. They went through a lot of hard work and created this thing. And I was lucky enough to actually go and uh, visit the people at Cambridge and go and have a chat with them um, just earlier last year when we were talking about how to get Java to work well on the Raspberry Pi. So I had a meeting with them, which was very, very interesting to see it actually working and, and seeing how it was going. But then it was officially launched on February the 29th of this year, and it was very, very successful. Basically, the first production run that they did was 10,000 boards, and they produced them in China, and they were uh, shipping them back to the UK mainly. And there were two companies that they partnered with to actually do the distribution of these things. One was RS, or Radio Spares, as we call them in the UK, and the other was Farnell. Both of these companies are very professional companies. They sell enormous numbers of electronic components to all the, the industries that use electronics. The launch of the Raspberry Pi board brought both, both of their web servers to their knees because so many people were trying to buy these things. And I remember I was trying to get on so I could actually buy one as well, and you just couldn't get onto the website. And RS actually thought that, or said that they had over 100,000 pre-orders in one day, which is why it's taken a while for these things to actually get into circulation. So current production is about 4,000 boards per day. Um, one of the nice things, certainly from my perspective, is that they've actually just uh, shifted production away from China which is where they had originally done the production. And they're now doing production in the UK. So Sony have a factory in Wales, and they're now producing the boards for the Raspberry Pi organization. So it's, it's nice from a, a UK perspective. So let's talk about what you actually get in your Raspberry Pi. Well, the first thing is it's an ARM processor. And specifically, it's an ARM 11 core running at 700 megahertz. So that's, what, that's probably about, I don't know, eight, nine-year-old machine, maybe a bit older than that if you compare it to a PC. I'm trying to think when I had a 700 megahertz machine that I was using. It's a Broadcom system on a chip package. So that means that most of the components are in a single package. And um, so it's... When you look at the board, there's this kind of like chip in the middle, which is not the processor. That's actually the memory. The, the processor sits underneath the memory. So it's quite a, a clever design in terms of the board. The nice thing about it is you can overclock it. And just recently, the Raspberry Pi people have said that they will now allow you to overclock it up to one gigahertz, and you won't invalidate the warranty, because they're that confident of the production of their machines that they say that you can overclock it up to one gigahertz and it won't actually invalidate the warranty. Um, I was at a Raspberry Pi meetup on Saturday, which was here in San Francisco, and there was uh, one of the people from the Raspberry Pi organization there, and he was talking about some of the details of that, and he said that there are people who have actually overclocked them to 1.2 gigahertz, but that does invalidate the warranty if it goes wrong. Um, what you find is that you can, can continue to turn up the clock speed, but then you run into problems with memory access and it becomes very unstable. But it's worth knowing that you can crank it up a bit if you really want to. Memory is fairly, I'm going to say, memory is fairly limited at only 256 megabytes coming from a person who started computing with 16 kilobytes. 
Um, but clearly, by today's standards, 256 megabytes is not a huge amount. But it is amazing what you can actually do with it. Um, some of the, the, the sort of internal workings of the Broadcom chip means that because you've got um, GPU uh, in there as well, you can do a lot of media processing without having to hammer the processor. And so 256 megabytes is still actually a lot of memory in terms of being able to do most of the things that you want to do. In terms of I.O., things that you've got to connect to it, you've got um, video, so you can either do that through HDMI or a composite video, so there's a phono socket that you can plug into. The idea with this is that they want people to be able to just use their television rather than having to buy a separate monitor. So the price is $35 for the board. What you don't want to have to do is then have to buy you know, a, a monitor to go with it. That would be rather expensive. So if you can use your TV, that's great. You have to find a keyboard. You have to find a flash card. But it keeps the price down as much as possible. There are two USB ports. Um, this is only on the Model B. Currently, they're only selling the Model B. Um, the Model A um, has less I.O. on it but, uh, and is also cheaper. So it's going to be $25 when they finally launch that. The Model B also has Ethernet on it, which the Model A won't. And then you've got a bunch of header pins that you can connect things to. So there's um, some GPIO lines. There's um, a UART for serial communication. There's SPI and I squared C that are supported if you want to do more sophisticated kinds of um, I.O. Um, there's also a couple of extra connectors on there, one of the, which is designed for a camera. So the, there's future growth there in terms of being able to connect something like a camera to it. So let's talk a little bit about ARM architecture. A brief but interesting history lesson to go with our history lesson of the, um, how the Raspberry Pi came into being. As I said, the, the, the BBC Micro was this machine that was built back in 1981. And it was based on a 6502 processor, which to me is a lovely processor. It's an 8-bit processor with a nice simple instruction set. It's a flat memory model. If you're trying to learn assembler code, it's a wonderful place to start because it's nice and easy. So I really like that. When the people at Acorn, who were the company who manufactured the, the computers, started thinking about what they were going to do next, they decided that the 6502 wasn't going to be powerful enough. 8-bit processor wasn't going to be suitable for what they had in mind. They wanted to get into business machines, and they wanted to have something more powerful. So they looked around, and they figured out that actually designing your own processor wasn't that hard. So these are people who were at Cambridge. So for them, things are a little bit different. If, if I was there, it would like be, I'm not designing my own chip. Um, but anyway, they, they thought, yes, let's look around, figure out how to build our own chip. And at, the, at that time, there was a research project going on just down the road from here at Berkeley about risk, reduced instru instruction set computing. The idea that you had less instructions, which you could execute faster. So rather than having more complex instructions, you had a smaller instruction set, but you could execute them much more quickly. And so the idea is that the efficiency is better. The other thing is that if you look at machines that have, or processors that have more complex instruction sets, um, there was a, a survey that was done, or a, an analysis that was done, which looked at the Unix kernel. And they identified that only 30% of the instructions of a Motorola 68000 were actually being used when you ran the kernel. So why have all these extra instructions if you're not going to use them? Make it a smaller, um, smaller instruction set, make the silicon easier to produce. So just as a, a useless aside here, Motorola 68000, another one of my favorite processors because it has a flat memory model. Anybody know why it's called the Motorola 68000? Well, I know it's produced by Motorola, so you don't get a point for that. Um, no, it's called the Motorola 68000 because it had 68,000 transistors in it. Just like I say, useless piece of information for you. Um, so the idea was that they wanted to create a machine that had less instructions, but m um, potentially more registers, so that you could do more things using very quick references to memory, rather than having to go to main memory, which was slower. And in fact, one of the architectures that came out of that was the Spark architecture. Um, and that was what we did at Sun for a long time, and now at Oracle. So then what they actually produced was the Acorn RISC machine. And that was the first 
if you like, arm, because it, that was, um, if you reduce it down to its, I suppose it would be ariscum, but it sh they actually called it the arm. So that was a 32-bit data, address lines, 26-bit address space, and 27 registers. And the first machine that they produced of that was the Acorn Archimedes. Now, I saw not many people put their hands up to say they had a, a, a BBC Micro. Anybody have an Ar Archimedes? Oh, okay. Andrew did. Oh, and they're back as well. Great. Okay. Two people. Um, so then time went on, and they basically spun off the, the chip manufacturer, or the chip design business, I should say, from Acorn, and they renamed the ARM the Advanced Risk Machines. So that's where ARM came from. Now, if you look at the, the features of the ARM processor, it is a 32-bit risk architecture. So it's designed on the same ideas that they had before. Interestingly, ARM now accounts for about 75% of the embedded 32-bit CPU market. So if you've got an iPhone, if you've got a lot of different Android phones, they're all using ARM processors inside. There's lots and lots of places where ARM processors get used. And in fact, last year, they sold over 8 billion ARM-based chips. And that brings to a grand total over 30 billion. In fact, the, the number that was uh, told to me yesterday was about 35 billion in total. Absolutely zero of those were manufactured by ARM, which is really quite impressive because basically they design the chips and then they sell the designs to other people. Other people then put them into packages, fabricate them, and actually produce chips from them. Now, what makes... Um, in terms of the, the ab well, yes, like I say, so abstract architecture and microprocessor uh, designs is what they actually sell. And then the Raspberry Pi, like I say, is based on an ARM 11 processor with an ARM V6 instruction set. So the, you have different versions of the instruction set, which we'll talk a little bit more in a moment. One of the great things about the ARM processor, which makes it ideal for the Raspberry Pi, is the fact that it has very low power consumption. So basically, that means that it's good for mobile devices because it doesn't generate a lot of heat. And it means that you can power it, in terms of the Raspberry Pi, off a 5-volt only power supply. You don't need 12 volts and 5 volts, which you need for most PCs. And you can get away with 700 milliamps, which means that you can use a USB device. Um, OK, that's more than you can get from a standard USB port. But if you've got something like a Mac, that will actually give you enough to power your Raspberry Pi. Um, and you can easily buy one of these wall plugs, which will give you enough to power your Raspberry Pi. So again, it, it makes life simpler in terms of being able to get these things into the hands of children, because you don't need to buy a screen. You don't need to buy a particularly expensive power supply to run it. So it keeps the, the price down. The other thing is you don't need any cooling. Because if you run it and you put your finger on the, the, the chip in the middle, you'll find that it, it gets a little bit warm, but it's not anything like hot. So it's really good at uh, actually not using a huge amount of power. And therefore, you don't need a fan, you don't need a heat sink. So in terms of um, current ARM technology, there are different versions. So there's the ARM V6, which is the sort of slightly older version that uh, they have at the moment. There's the ARM 11, and then there's the ARM Cortex-M, which are different implementations of that, which people will then use to produce chips. ARM v7 is the sort of the current version, the most up-to-date version that's being used, and there's a number of different uh, versions of that. There's the ARM Cortex-A, the ARM Cortex-M, the ARM Cortex-R. Basically, those vary in terms of the amount of power they require, the clock speed that they run at, and so on. ARM V8 is the, the new version that has been announced but is not uh, actually shipping yet. And that's going to support 64-bit data and addressing, 32-bit instructions, and going to have 30 registers. So they're, they're looking to move more into the idea of the enterprise market. And there's actually companies now that are building racks of ARM-based boards that will run as enterprise servers. The advantage, of course, is because it's low power consumption, it reduces the need for cooling, and that can reduce the cost of actually running a data center by a significant amount. Let's talk then about Java on the ARM processor and specifically the Raspberry Pi. So one of the things that um, we have an issue with is that in terms of Oracle, we have had embedded Java for quite a while. And we have different versions of that which we address at different types of processor. 
because we're not just dealing with an Intel processor here, so we need to address specific types of processor. What we've had is a version of em embedded Java which will run on an ARM v6 processor. But the specification for ARM v6 doesn't mandate the inclusion of a floating point unit. So we don't expect there to be a floating point unit, so we don't actually configure it to use hardware floating point. So we configure it to use a library which will emulate the idea of floating point, do the mathematics in software. Floating point units only became mandatory or part of the specification, if you like, on ARM v7. In terms of the Raspberry Pi, it does have a floating point unit in there. So there is hardware acceleration for floating point mathematics. The thing is that if you use a library and you do it in software, it's a lot slower than doing it using the hardware. So that becomes an issue in terms of performance. What we need to do is we need to create both a Linux distribution and a version of the JVM that use the hard floating point <coughs> capabilities of the machine. So there needs to be a special implementation, special version that we can make available. So we need special builds of both. Um, right now, the, the Raspberry Pi organization have released a, a version of the distro which is based on Debian, which is compiled to use the hard floating point. So there's the Raspberry and distro, which is the most common one that people are using, and that's available to use hard floating point. Oracle are currently working on hard floating point version of the JVM. It's, it's one of those things that's actually technically very simple, but not simple to actually launch it into the market. The reason for that is that from a, a technical point of view, all we have to do is set a few compiler flags and run make, and then we get a hard floating point version of the JVM. That's the easy bit. The tricky bit is that we actually do have to test it. So we want to make sure that there aren't any like, enormous bugs lurking in there when we switch on hard floating point. So what we're doing at the moment is we are doing the verification of this. Um, I have actually got a version of the, the hard floating point JVM that I've tried on the Raspberry Pi and it works quite happily. But of course, because we haven't done all the testing and the QA associated with that, we can't actually launch it as a binary distribution yet. It will be happening soon. I can't give you a date. This is one of the places where my safe harbor statement is actually useful. So I can't give you a date for this. Um, but it's not going to be a long time before that comes out. So is there like a beta of the No. I agree with you absolutely. And there will be an early access version out soon. But what we need to do is internally do the testing, you know, actually run all of our regression tests internally. And that does actually take a bit of time, especially because we've got Java 1 this week. We've had a lot of stuff we've been doing before Java 1. Like I say, it's not going to be a long time before you see it. So don't be thinking it's six, eight months away. Um, I mustn't mention dates. Um, so, so it will be sometime in the future, but the near future, shall we say. So that, that, that's where we're at with that. Now, interestingly, from a, a Java perspective, there's a number of things that the uh, makers of the, or the designers of the ARM processor have done to make life better for Java processing. So over time, they've added more and more components to the, the instruction set that you have in terms of the ARM. So we've, we've kind of, it's still risk, but it's risk with a bit of CISC on the side. So some of the things they've added is things like um, digital signal processing. Because a lot of these chips get used in mobile phones, having digital signal processing is a really useful thing to be able to include. Uh, it enables you to do things like voice over IP directly on the processor and stuff like that. Interestingly, again, because the chip has been used a lot in mobile phones, they've actually included um, Giselle, which is, in effect, a way of executing bytecodes directly in the silicon. It's a fairly basic implementation, so you can't really get a huge amount of improvement in performance from it. But it's nice to see that there is actually that included, so you know, we could potentially take advantage of some of that. Um, there's a bunch of things called Thumb, Thumb, Thumb 2, and Thumb EE. Um, which is basically about how you can reduce the size of your executable. So it's not really like adding more instructions. It's like making the instructions that you have already a bit smaller. So thumb is for 16-bit instructions. Thumb 2 is for 32-bit instructions. And by manipulating things like operands and stuff and leaving them out, you can actually reduce the size of your code. Um, 
Some EE is quite interesting because that's actually been designed around the idea of having a virtual machine which is doing just-in-time compilation. So it works quite nicely with that. So that's, again, something that we could potentially take advantage of in the JVM to improve performance. Um, floating point, we already kind of briefly covered that. Neon is extensions to the instruction set to enable media processing um, so that you can do better, uh, you know, faster processing of media and things like that. It's a bit like SSE on the, the Intel product range. And then there's also some security enhancements, which um, I don't know too much about the details of that. It's too secure. Um, but it adds an extra bit to instructions to indicate whether the uh, security is turned on or off for those things. So let's talk about some of the things we can do with Java on the Raspberry Pi. Um, basically, I've divided this up into the various sections that I've looked at in terms of using it. So there's sound, there's vision, um, serial access, using USB, and then finally using the, the GPIO lines. So the first thing is making a noise with Java on the Raspberry Pi. Now, I, I found this to be rather um, troublesome, shall we say. Um, it, it seems to be that, certainly with the earlier distributions, there were some um, issues around not having inclusion of the ALSA drivers for the, the board. So you actually had to install those uh, manually because they were still in early access. Those are now included in the system directly, so if you're using the latest distros, then you will be getting the sound drivers with that. And so you can actually do things like A play and it will play back um, WAV files without any problem. So then I started looking at the Java Sound API and trying to figure out what we could do with that. And I got very, very confused because there's a whole bunch of stuff in terms of how Java works with the underlying platform. And it, it all kind of relates to the ideas of um, platform neutrality and write once, run anywhere, which can come back and bite you a bit. Because um, there's like the ALSA drivers on Linux, which handle the sound on the Raspberry Pi. But then there's also this other thing called Pulse Audio, which is a sort of, um, again, it's a kind of platform neutral idea for Linux. So you've got a, a, um, an interface which is consistent across different platforms from a hardware perspective. And I, I played around with this for quite a long time. I, I didn't have enough time to really dig into it in too much detail. But basically, I got to the point where I could play certain WAV files without too much problem. Um, some of the WAV files that wouldn't play, bizarrely, would play if I used Aplay. So I don't quite know why they weren't playing through the Java side of things, but they weren't. Um, if I tried to use the MIDI interface, then it would start up and then it would just hang. And uh, despite using S-Trace and, and trying to figure out what it was hanging on, there wasn't anything obvious. What I find a little bit confusing about this is that when I was playing around with this a while ago um, on one of the earlier distributions, I somehow got sound working, but I don't know how. <laughs> And, and so one of the things that I was testing on there was free TTS, which is text-to-speech, and so sort of voice synthesis. And so on one of the older distributions, I actually had free TTS working, but now I don't. So I'm not quite sure what I did before. It's one of those really irritating things where I can't remember what magic incantations I, I cast upon the machine in order to get the sound working. But when I go back, I, I'll go back and I'll hopefully figure this out, and then I, I will actually put a blog entry up so that um, if people are interested in using sound on the, the Raspberry Pi, then you'll actually be able to understand how to do that. Sorry? Who's saying? Enable module in the kernel. What the, which one? The ALSA? Okay, I'll, I'll have to talk to you about that later because that sounds interesting, but um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, JavaFX on the Raspberry Pi. Clearly, we want to be able to take advantage of the fact that you have video output, and so it would be really nice if we can uh, also include JavaFX for these very nice graphical applications. So where we're at with that at the moment is, again, it's currently internal builds only. We're not we haven't actually released it uh, officially yet. There is a release of JarFX that runs on the uh, Beagle board, which just came out a few days ago. 
That will work on the Raspberry Pi, but we haven't certified it yet because we haven't gone through all the QA. So it, you can use it, and it certainly does run, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, on the machine. So it's, it's not too much of an issue, but we don't actually officially say, yes, it's supported on the Raspberry Pi yet. Um, a lot of the, the work that we have to do there is around optimizations for the Prism rendering engine, which is part of JavaFX, and trying to get the most out of the way that we work with the, the underlying system. Because the Raspberry Pi has very good capabilities in terms of graphics, um, we'd like to be able to take advantage of those to give you the best possible performance. So right now, the way that we're doing that is we have four different ways that you can configure JavaFX to run. Uh, you can either do it um, as X11. So if you're using the desktop manager, then you can run it with X11 and you can actually have it run inside the desktop manager and, and just as you would with any other applica application. Then we've got uh, handling the frame buffer directly. So there's, there's actually direct FB, which is not currently working due to the fact that the Raspberry Pi implementation only does it in 8-bit. And the way that the engineers have done it needs either 16 or 32-bit access for the direct frame buffer. Then there, there is a frame buffer access with soft rendering. And then there's lastly an OpenGL rendering with direct to the frame buffer. Essentially, what these things do, if DirectFB was working, um, the lower down you go the list, the better the performance. So if you run it on uh, using X11, it's actually going to be fairly clunky. Once you get outside of X11 and you start going direct to the frame buffer, you get much better performance. And if you use OpenGL as well, because that can be hardware accelerated, um, we can get some really quite good performance out of that. Combine that with hard floating point, because of course you're going to need the, the mathematics, and we should get very good uh, results out of that eventually. I'll, I'll show you some things that uh, I've done, and uh, you, you can judge for yourself. Um, that would have been the OpenGL version. That was also running hard float, um, which is why we're not releasing it because, of course, we saw that it had a little issue where it had a little stumble there. Um, so it has, obviously hasn't gone through all the QA cycle yet. So we want to make sure that everything's uh, running. But yes, that would have been OpenGL running on a hard float JVM with Raspbian. So another one of the things that you can do with the uh, Raspberry Pi is you can use a serial port because um, if you look at the GPIO pins, um, there are a couple of the pins which are your transmit and receive lines for the, um, the UART on there. If you are inclined, you can get yourself one of these MAX, uh, what is it, the two, uh, 3232 chip. Um, because the thing is that if you use the, uh, the UART directly, it's TTL logic level, so it's uh, 3.3 or 5 volts depending on how it's configured. If you want to use RS-232, RS-232 is 12 volts. So you need to be able to uh, change the voltage. And this chip will do that very nicely for you. So you can uh, solder that up with a few capacitors. And you can end up with a, a very nice little box like this, which provides you with a set of uh, connectors that you can pin, uh, connect to the GPIO lines, and then a standard RS-232 uh, sort of D-type connector. What that allows you to do is to access the console on the Raspberry Pi through a serial port. So when it boots up, if you don't have a monitor connected, you can actually see all the boot messages coming through the serial port. And so this is the way I actually use the Raspberry Pi when I'm at home, is I have it connected through a serial port and I just use putty and I can see all the, the boot messages come up. And that way I don't have to change um, the monitor from one of my other machines. So it's pretty easy to do that and you can get access to the serial port like that. Um, in terms of USB peripherals, USB is this universal serial bus, um, but it's not quite as simple as serial, because with serial, you're just dealing with a bunch of bits and bytes that you send at a particular speed across a link. With USB, some of the devices will appear to be like a serial device. A lot of them actually need specific drivers. You know, it's, it's the same as um, you do with any operating system. You, you need specific drivers. So if you're lucky and you plug something in, you see something like slash dev slash TTY USB zero, and you're up and running, and you can communicate with it using a serial connection. Some more complicated devices, if you want to use them on the Raspberry Pi, there is the, um, the USB libraries, and you can actually hack some native code and then talk directly to the USB device. Um, 
it, it does get a bit more complicated in terms of figuring out what specific things you need uh, for the communication protocol and so on. But if you want to, you can install USB-1.0.0 dev, and that gives you a lot of the stuff you need for the USB libraries. From a Java perspective, working with a, a serial type device, whether it's a USB one or a, a serial port, then you can use the RxTx package. That's really an extension to the Java COM API or a re-implementation of the Java COM API. So again, apt get install librxtx Java will give you the libraries that you need and then you can just reference those, the jar file in your application and then you can, you're up and running. One of the things that, um, caught me out a bit until somebody explained what I needed to do, was that by default, the devices that are probed by the RxTx libraries are only slash dev slash TTY capital S something. So S001 or S002. If your device, when you plug it in, is TTY USB zero or TTY ACM zero, then it won't be seen by the libraries. But what you can do is you can set a property in, the, in your code, so system.setProperty gnu.io.rxtx.serialports to the name of your device, and then it will pick it up. So it just makes it a little bit easier. Because what I was doing is I, I tended to um, do a symbolic link between slash dev slash ttys004 to my device. And every time I rebooted the machine, I lost it. So it was getting a bit irritating. So this is a much better solution to the problem. One of the things I, I looked at and I basically, I found this through um, looking at somebody else's blog, so um, somebody else had done the hard work for me, was the OWI robot arm. And there's a company in the UK called Maplin who sell these, and they were on special offer the weekend that I saw the blog entry, so I thought, oh, I'll have one of those. So 25 quid got me one of these, and I set about building a Java interface for it so that I could actually use it. So it comes with a USB interface, but it's not a serial type of interface, so you do actually need a bit more complexity. It has a Windows-only driver, but it is recognized by Linux as a USB device. So when, it, when you look at dmessage, you will see that it has recognized it as a USB device, and therefore in slash dev slash bus slash USB, there is a device that you can access to talk to the, um, the controller that's on there. So what you can do is you can do, write some native code, talk to the, the specific device and actually have it do what you need to do. I guess, in theory, because you could open the device as a, through Java, you could probably get away without using JNI and without using native code. I haven't actually tried that yet. Um, it only occurred to me the other day that you could probably do that. Um, so I, I might go back and see whether I could do that without using JNI. It's a very simple control protocol, um, three bytes, message, you send to it, which says uh, for byte one controls the arm, byte two controls the base going left or right, and byte three controls there's a little light on the, the arm. And then you can combine movements if you do some bit twiddling um, to sort of combine the motors together, and so you have to do some, a little bit of um, fudging it to, if you want to stop one motor individually, because you, you have to stop all the motors at the same time, there's only one stop command. So you have to remember which ones are running and then start them again immediately afterwards. But it's, it's fairly trivial. So from a JNI code point of view, a um, few native functions, native C functions using libusb. Um, again, because the protocol had already been decoded by somebody else, it was fairly straightforward for me to just have a look at the code and, and figure out what needed to be done. And then, Using JNI, you can define a native method in your code. Um, you then create the necessary stub header file using Java H, and then you can compile that into a um, shared library, and then off you go. I did find that JNI, um, I've used JNI before, but um, I do find JNI a bit uh, hard work. It's, uh, it's not as easy to use as it could be, which is probably one of the reasons why in uh, sometime probably JDK, JDK 9 or beyond, we're actually talking seriously within Oracle about rewriting JNI and making it easier to use. And funnily enough, when I talked to one of the engineers about this, he said, oh yes, we, we deliberately designed JNI to be difficult to use so that we could discourage people from using it. <laughs> that's, that's not the best approach to the design of software, is it really? <laughs> So in terms of um, control of the robot arm, once you get to the Java level, it's pretty straightforward. So you've got your um, Java wrapper methods. So okay, so I want to move the arm gripper 
in a particular, or in, then sleep for a particular time so it moves at a particular distance. Um, then we can stop it, and then we close it, going the other way, and do that. So I'll show you an example of that um, when I show you the demos in a few minutes. So the next thing I decided to connect to my Raspberry Pi was a, a gamepad controller. So I bought one of the, the standard USB gamepad controllers and set about figuring out how to use that. So Linux supports the drivers for those out of the box. So it's very easy. The Raspberry Pi supports it. All works very nicely. So you get the appropriate devices that you want, slash dev, slash input. And then there's this nice Java API that was written many, many years ago called JInput. So for gaming, it's already been done. It's nice mature technology. Nobody's touched it since 2003. Um, so all I had to do there was um, recompile the code on the Raspberry Pi because it uh, did, did need a couple of tweaks because th there's a bit of native code that gets built into that as well. Um, so when I, when I actually went about um, compiling it, I had a couple of problems with the class path, which seemed odd. And then there was the reference to uh, a variable that had been defined in Linux some years ago, and then it had been dropped from Linux because they decided they didn't want it anymore. So I just had to comment out a bit of code for that. And then I also had to rename the, um, the, input, the, the step, sorry, I had to rename the shared object library that I created to add a, dash, uh, add a 64 onto the end of it. I don't quite know why, but um, after doing some S trace and figuring out what it was that it wanted, I renamed the file and it all worked. So um, it's one of those like, bizarre things. Um, yeah, devices, yes. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting, so the, the input devices that you get on the Linux uh, distribution, when you plug in the games controller, it will create the necessary device entries, but it doesn't always, it doesn't give you read-write access to everybody. So it's, it's a root device and it doesn't give you read-write access to everybody. So I spent quite a while trying to sort out UDEV rules. Anybody used UDEV rules? Few people. I don't like them. I couldn't make them work. Um, I must go back and try and fix that because you can, in theory, set up a UDEV rule so when you plug something in, it will set a particular permissions, it will set a particular ownership and do all sorts of things. But every time I tried it, it didn't work. So, um, from a code perspective, it's not too difficult to, um, to get things working. So, uh, what I did was I wrote a small library that sat on top of JInput. So, I just created a new gamepad controller and then I uh, set it up so I had listeners organized for the different events. So, I could listen for a particular button being pressed on the game controller to do something and I could listen for the, the joystick. So, whether it's moving left or right, up or down and so on. I then just have a, a thread sitting in the background that's picking up the information from the, the game controller and then generating the events for my application. And then if we want to use that, then it's pretty simple. We create ourselves a new um, listener. We add in some code where we say, okay, if it's button one, we want to control our robot arm. So we just say, okay, set the gripper light to be on and that's all nice and easy. And if we want to move the, the robot in a particular direction, we can use the joystick and process the events from that and then control the robot arm. So it's really kind of linking the two things together. So as I'll show you, you can control the robot arm using the gamepad controller. Okay, so just a little bit about the GPIO lines. This is a sort of diagram of the, the different lines that you've got. They're kind of color coded depending on what the, because um, some of them have more than one use. So there are numbers which are the actual number of the line which you can access as a general purpose input and output line. And then you've got uh, things like you've got the five volt power line, you've got a 3.3 .3 volt power line, you've got one, one ground pin. That's, that's a slightly, um, slight downside, but if you look at the P2 connector, which is a, another little header pin you've got, there are two other ground pins on pin seven and eight. So um, if you're doing something which requires more than one ground pin, there's actually three that you can use if you go to the, the second uh, connector. And then, like I say, you've got things like um, I squared C, so you've got SDA, SCL lines, you've also got the um, SPI with MOSI, MISO, and S clock, so that you can talk um, from the processor using those protocols. And like I say, um, 14 and 15, the two orange ones at the top there, those are the UART lines, so that you can get the, the serial console. Now, using those does require some very magic incantations. 
I did not do this myself. I found some very, very clever person who'd written a blog entry about this, because there's no way I would have been able to find this, this weird kind of memory address stuff thing. So basically, you, you've got to memory map some of the address space of the, um, of the system. And it's, it's like if you did basic with the BBC Micro or something like that, peek and poke. Um, so you, you end up memory mapping the slash dev slash mem and uh, creating a malloc block and then doing some memory mapping there. And then essentially what you need to do to uh, use the GPIO pins is do some bit twiddling. So if you want to set a pin for input, you need this um, rather obscure set of um, bit twiddling of different things. If you want to set a pin to be output, you have to set it to be input first and then set it to be output. So you can combine those two together. And then basically, for output, you've got the idea of setting the pin high or setting the pin low. Uh, you can also do input, of course, but for output, you can set the pin high, you can set the pin low. Um, so what I did then was obviously hide the magic incantations with J and I. Um, I. I thought about it afterwards, and one of the things is that dev mem, you do need root access. So you, anything that's going to use GPIO lines, like GPIO lines does have to be as root. Um, one of the things I want to try when I get home is to actually write a device driver, take myself back, way back to when I used to do device driver work, and um, change that so um, avoid the problems of actually having to do it as root so that you can do it as a, just a, a normal user. And then you just end up with some simple uh, JNI type code where you can do GPIO in it, then you can do out, set particular pins to be output, and you can then set them either low or high depending on what you want to do. So here's an example of how you can use the GPIO lines. I have here a Lego motor, which I'm going to show you actually working in, in a couple of moments. And in order for that to work, because I have this, this uh, project that I'm, I'm working on, because a long time ago I built a, uh, a robot which was uh, a blackjack player. And I did it using Lego. And I used the, the old Lego Mindstorms version 1, the big yellow bricks. And I used Legos. So I wrote the code in Java, and then I, I programmed it on the, these bricks. What I really want to do is I want to go back to that project and actually use Lego to do all of the, the well, sorry, use the Raspberry Pi to control all the Lego so I can actually have a, a Raspberry Pi blackjack player. So the first stage of that is getting the motors working. Now, the motors that you use with Lego are nine volt motors. And clearly, you've got TTL logic, which is a very low current. You can't drive them directly with the GPIO pins. So you need a little bit of circuitry here. This is what's called an H-bridge. There is a very nice chip that you can buy, the L293D. I thoroughly recommend getting the D variant of this chip because it has the diodes that you need built in. If you buy the non-D version, you need to actually put a whole bunch of diodes around it as well. So if you buy this, this one, it's very, very simple to wire up. You simply have two GPIO lines that control whether it goes clockwise or anti-clockwise. And then you've got your power supply from the Raspberry Pi, ground from the Raspberry Pi, the power supply for the motors, and then the two wires for the actual motor in order to control it. And it's, it, you know, me as a non-hardware person, even I can actually build uh, a little board that controls a couple of motors. For SPI and I squared C, um, there is some work that's been done. If you go to, there's a guy called Chris Boot, and he's written a blog entry about this, and he's actually um, published a bunch of code that you can install into the kernel, which will give you access to the, the SPI interface and also the I squared C interface. I haven't actually had time to, to try these out yet, so I haven't got to the point where I've done any Java uh, work with that. One of the things I've, I've bought recently is I've got a little um, display screen. And again, I, I found somebody's blog entry. I like blog entries. Um, where somebody has shown how you can actually drive the display from uh, an SPI interface. And so I've, I've got a bit of soldering to do when I get home. And then I'll be plugging that in and see if I can actually drive the display from the Raspberry Pi with the idea that I can then implement JavaFX on it and have a, you know, a mini iPad. Um, maybe. <laughs> Yes. You started by saying that uh, you know, one of the ideas behind the Raspberry Pi is to make it suitable for kids to learn. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, okay, no, no, no. Fair enough, fair enough, yes. It, it's, um, yeah. 
I, I, I take your point exactly. So I, I have demonstrated a lot of complexity, which I wouldn't want to put in front of your average 11-year-old um, who doesn't know anything about programming. But that's not, that's not the idea behind the Raspberry Pi initially. The Raspberry Pi, from an educational point of view, what they're doing is they're providing, uh, the idea is to have a system that will boot up, you get a, an X um, windowing interface, and then they will use things like Scratch to start with. So they will learn about programming through things like Scratch. Then they'll move on. Um, I don't know, is Michael in the room? Michael Colling? Oh, yes, there he is. Um, so Greenfoot is one of the things that we're, we're looking at in terms of getting that running on there so that you've got the ability to have move children through from Scratch through to IDEs which are designed to help children understand how to start programming. And then they can move from Greenfoot into BlueJay and then from BlueJay into NetBeans. And so, yeah, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is more the hobbyist kind of thing rather than a, a school children's kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the capabilities are there. And what hopefully we can do is if we can make things simple from a Java perspective, so if we can publish the necessary libraries and things, then we can make it really easy for the more advanced students who do start understanding Java to then be able to pull these libraries together and then build things that use a gamepad, that use the, you know, the control lines and th so on, things like that. I wouldn't expect your know, average 11 year old to be hacking SPI or I squared C right now. So yeah, but it's a good point, yes. So like I say, he, he has done some work that's created a number of, um, uh, some code that you can use and it will actually give you devices that access the I squared C and the SPI interfaces. So just to sort of conclude the, 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 the presentation part before I get onto the demos, um, Raspberry Pi is a very cool and very cheap computer. Ultimately, it's a Linux computer, um, but it does allow you to do all sorts of, of great things. It is great for teaching. There's lots of potential for it. Uh, it's a great introduction to the ARM processor um, if you do want to go into more complex things lower down. Java works pretty well. Um, it will get better. We're certainly targeting the Raspberry Pi specifically as one of our platforms in terms of embedded because we want to help both the Raspberry Pi organization, people like the Greenfoot organization. We want to make sure that these things work well when people see Java in this kind of area. Um, so opportunities are limitless. Okay. A couple of places further information, obviously rrecord.com, um, embedded. There's a Raspberry Pi user guide that's just been published by Eben Upton, who's the, really one of the, the main founders of the, the Raspberry Pi organization. And then, of course, raspberrypi.org, which is the place where there's all sorts of information being published about what's going on. So with that, let's move on to the demos, which are potentially some of the more interesting parts. So what I'm going to do first is I'll just show you, because how much time have I got? Seven minutes, okay. Um, ah, that's not quite what I expected. Ah, there we go. Right, so I'm, I'm just going to show you one simple application running. Did I type that rightly? No, I didn't. Running JavaFX. The problem is I can't see this. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Hang on. <laughs> right. This is why I always I tend to use. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> At least I put the message in there. <laughs> right, let's try that again. That's better. We go. Okay. Ah, that's not so good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this one for now because. <laughs> Does that look clock output then? Yeah. Uh, hang on. What's it? Settings. Oh, no, hang on, EG, no, I know what it is, hang on. Um, yeah, give me a second. Don't run away. I thought I fixed that. Obviously I hadn't. Ah. 
Yeah, it was a typo. It does take a little while to start up because this is the soft float version and it's not tuned and it is still, as you can see, early access. So don't worry about that. Hmm. That wasn't what I was expecting to see either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to give up on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty poor, isn't it? <laughs> It worked on my TV in my hotel room, but clearly it doesn't like the, uh, whatever the, um oh, come on. Right, okay. Let's go back to this. We'll avoid that. Let's do some other stuff. Right, so, like I said, I've got the, um, the Lego motor there. So what I'm gonna do is just run, a little application, and all it's going to do is just move the motor. So that's not very exciting, is it? So I'll just move it a couple of times backwards and forwards. Uh, I used that really just to, to make sure it was moving in the right direction and also to calibrate it in terms of how far it moved for a particular amount of time. Okay, so that's, that's that. So did anybody come to my session yesterday where we did the connect stuff? and the things like that? Yes. yes, okay, I know you were there. Okay, well that's all right, so that, that's, not gonna, that's not going to spoil the excitement for everybody else then. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this in. Right, what I've got here is a thing called a, a Neuroski or Neurosky headset, which is essentially a brain monitor. And what you do is you can actually connect this through a USB dongle to your to your Raspberry Pi, and hopefully, I'll just run this, I'm gonna run, let me see if I've, turn, I remember to turn it on first, this helps. I sometimes don't get a very good connection, which can be problematic. Let me just see if this is uh, gonna, okay, come on, yep, good. Okay, right, we've got some readings, that, that's the important thing. So I'll just check that. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the, the, the sensor that I've got to monitor my brain waves, and one of the values that it returns is my um, attention value. And then what I'm gonna do is, sorry? <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna use that value to control the motor. So if I do... <laughs> In theory, Okay, so there we go, yep, so it does it once a second, basically. So it's monitoring my, my attention. So in theory, you see, the more I focus on it, <laughs> the more it should move. Um, I, I'm not totally convinced by it. It is moving, <laughs> I, I, can, I can definitely move it, but I'm not sure that I'm thinking about something which is moving it, it's just, you know. <laughs> It's kind of like a random number generator. <laughs> but anyway, you get the point. So, so what I really wanted to do was to, to show that you could actually connect, you know, multiple things there. So then I'm gonna, I, I, how much time have I got? Not very much, okay. Um, let me just disconnect this. And I'll connect my robot arm. Now, I do have, Right. Now, I just have to check whether, because sometimes it doesn't like, yeah, okay, so it's found the device, because sometimes it gets a bit confused with the USB. Um, now, the other thing I have to do is I have to remember to change the permissions on, cast a few magic incantations. Now, in theory, uh, right, so if I just run G Add. Right, so the first thing, I'll just, just run this, because, mm, okay, and I'll point your exception, what? <laughs> oh, oh, I know, hang on. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. Right, let's try that again. <sighs> okay, that, that's... Why? <laughs> See, it was working in my hotel room literally an hour ago. I come here, it stops working. <laughs> I, got, I got no idea why that is not working. No. I'll, I'll try unplugging it and plugging it in again. I'll try plugging it in. <laughs> that, that'll be it. I plugged the keyboard back in. That's, that's what the problem is. Okay, that, that'll help. Right, okay. Now, now we're, that's better. Right. Yes, okay, good. So, so basically now I, c I can do things like I can move the, uh, the, joy pair, the joysticks and I can press buttons and get the events from that. So that, that's actually working, good. Okay, so now if I just do the very last demo, hopefully this will work. Robot. Now I do have a problem in that I do know that sometimes the, the motors, uh, there's, there's a USB th thing where it gets stuck. Um, okay. And now it's not doing anything. I did turn that one on, and I did plug that one in. <sighs> hmm. Ah. should say more than that. Okay, I'm really sorry about that, but I don't think that I've got, I think I've run out of time for that one, so I've got no idea why that one's not working. But it, it was working before, honest. <laughs>